welcome everybody to our Society 2045 uh, Friday talk. Just by way of a framing and introduction, Society 2045 was started a few years ago by a group of people who had the idea that by 2045, they wanted to create something uh, different in the world. And we've been having um, talks uh, every Friday. The ideas of individuals that are working in some way to create a world that's, uh, that will be better than, than, than the current world that we are, we are living in. The real goal is to impact uh, many of the major uh, institutions in the world. Um, today, it, it's our privilege, my privilege, to be talking with Alan Briskin. Um, Alan has been a friend of mine for 25, 30 years. We met in the context of both being uh, Barrett Kohler authors. Alan's academic work is in, in oh, um, his PhD is in psychology, but it's much, much uh, bigger than that. Alan happens to be among the, the listed exemplary graduates of, of the Fielding Institute. It was an interesting factoid when I found that out that he's actually on their website and noted as one of the uh, luminary uh, graduates. The thing I love about Alan is he always has the ability to provide a bit of sense of humor for some of the very, very deep, rich and broad um, concepts that he's been exploring. I remember seeing the title of the first book that I knew that Alan wrote called Stirring of the Soul in the Workplace. I think that in, in, in some ways kind of says it all in terms of his observation of what's going on broadly um, in society. So Alan, can you uh, kind of add anything to the introduction that I just made and uh, tell us a little bit about um, some of your current work and, and, and what it is that you've been thinking about and digging into. The one phrase that I didn't mention also was the idea of collective wisdom uh, and fields uh, are, are some of the areas of his latest inquiries. And I think that these are so critical if we're trying to create some, some large scale change. Thank you, Stuart. We have been friends for decades and uh, have been through developing group groups like the Barrett Collar Author Group, which was a pioneering effort in a publishing firm to bring authors together. Yeah. What I'd add in relation to what I'm going to talk about today is prior to writing The Stirring of Soul in the Workplace, I wrote a doctoral dissertation called The Institutionalization of the Soul. The, the stirring was a response to what I felt was a systematic way that the inner life of a person was being taken away from its relationship to the workplace. And when I wrote The Power of Collective Wisdom, my first question before even getting involved in the project, it was through the Fetzer Institute, was could I write about collective folly? Uh, because how do we really understand what wisdom is unless we can understand what it looks like when things go wrong? So it's in that context that I wanna talk about your invitation to talk about 2045, that, that what I appreciated about what those of you who have begun this is that you were not trying to go so far out ahead so that everyone could just go to Sugar Mountain, you know, and everything's going to be happy. And if we're just all, you know, uh, loving each other. And, and, um, and so it took me to what are the, what is the institutionalization part? What is the folly part that we would be inspired to try to understand and hold a better vision of the future? You know, it is such a central part of servant leadership that the quality that the servant leader has is that they can hold an image of a better future. And they can hold that even as it's being tested. So in, in thinking about how to sort of set up my comments on what is my hope for personal and collective growth over the next 20 years, I started looking at the global challenges that we have. And we're talking right now just... Uh, a week before Passover. And so as I was doing this, I was reminded that I'd sit as a child and we would repeat all the plagues. And then I was looking at the global challenges and I'm gonna read them kind of like I did at my dinner table. Invasive species, loss of biodiversity, deforestation, waste problems, soil contamination, water pollution, air pollution, climate change, 
We could add war and death of the firstborn. So to take that in, that, that uh, we are being called to address the fundamental existential continuation of the human, of the human race, not of the earth. The earth will be fine, but of the human race. And I was struck as I was doing this to Rumi's comment, the pains you feel are messengers. Listen to them. And so how does one really, as you are doing, try to listen and understand? And as often is the case, when the awareness of uh, the challenge becomes clearer to some people, the antidote is begun to be worked out. And uh, it happened that I was getting connected to a group originating mainly in the Nordic countries, but now globally called the Inner Development Goals. Some of you may have heard this. If you go on Google and look up Inner Development Goals, they have listed um, five areas and 23 qualities. And I'm gonna read you some of uh, those as a response to the 10 plagues. You know, And what they, they talk about was directly related to their study of the UN 17 sustainability goals. And they asked the question, these are all valid goals to address, but what is it needed for human beings to gather together and accomplish it? It's one thing to have a goal, but in a global environment, what are the kinds of qualities and skills people will need to deal with it? And so they came up with their five areas. And I'm gonna just, they'll all be recognizable to you, but but I wanna go into them a little bit and then talk about my work with fields. The five areas are relationship to self, which they call being, cognitive skills, which they call thinking in a very broad way, caring for others in the world, which they call relating, social skills that they call collaborating, and the ability to drive change, which they call acting. And within that, and, and this is gonna dovetail with the discussion I'm gonna have on fields, is I'll give you an idea of some of the key things that they identified that, get, that got grouped into these five categories. Co-creative skills, complexity awareness, communication skills, connectedness, empathy and compassion, courage, self-awareness, appreciation, openness, and learning mindset and an inner compass. What I wanna say about that and how it relates to my work is that they've done an extraordinary job. It's still framed for the most part as individual and then slash collective, but it's not actually talking about groups you know, it's sort of just saying we should all have these skills. Well, 7 billion people are not going to have these skills. And any one person is not going to have all of them. And so I want to shift our focus away from the individual to becoming aware of how groups function and the role of the individual in how groups function. This is the illuminating field slide. So I felt... Uh, when we were doing the research on collective wisdom and we wrote The Power of Collective Wisdom, the missing chapter was on fields. Some of you are, may be familiar with it through um, Otto Scharmer's work. He, he talks about the social field quite a bit. Uh, he was one of the people 20 years ago who, who really sort of seeded in my mind that there was something about fields. And and so my co-author, Mary Jolinas, and I are working on this, and it's been a, a voyage of discovery. It's like I had an intuition that there was a way to talk about the individual and the collective in more precise ways. And so I'm just going to walk you through a little bit about how we have uh, drawn boundaries around these fields and how I think it relates to the challenges that we just talked about. The personal field is recognizable uh, you know, th through all the psychological work we've done in self-awareness for energy healers, it's the biofield. It's this, it's the, it's the joining together of the physiological human body and its expression of a psychological meaning. So we are not aware consciously of how much oxytocin is currently in our body. We are not aware uh, unless we really pause to, to notice 
how deep or shallow our breath is. We don't keep track unless we're wearing one of those watches about the heart rate variability, but all of these things are expressions of our personal field. And, and then the inner uh, world of our thoughts, feelings, stances. Personal field has a dramatic effect on a social field, which we'll get into in a moment. If I can interrupt, could you please define what you mean by field? Yeah, I'm using the field in the broadest way of a boundary that contains information. And so by its nature, it's a blurry boundary, uh, but it's a way of looking at what energy and information is contained within a certain uh, drawn line. And in the way we've developed this, it's not just a concept. I mean, it's a conceptual idea but we talk about fields as being embodied and embedded. Embodied meaning that all of these things can be experienced through the human body and embedded meaning we're always part of something larger. A cell is part of an organ, a organ is part of the body. The body is part of a, a whole person. A whole person is part of a group that the embedded nature of our lives uh, is what, we're bring, what I'm asking to bring to consciousness. How am I embedded? Thank you. And so the personal field is simply conceptually, it's just that boundary around the person and about two, three feet outside the person. Uh, groups, some of you know, like HeartMath have studied the electromagnetic uh, fields that are created by our heartbeat. Uh, but we all know this both intuitively and personally. You go into a room where people are fighting and yelling at each other. You know, you're, you can be aware of it even without even knowing the language that's being spoken. You go into a group that is laughing and, and easy with each other, and you're drawn in to, to want to share and be part of that. You could walk into a room and no one looks at you, and you may begin to feel feelings of exclusion or if you're in the right place. It was an extraordinary conversation yesterday with a Harvard, the president of the Black Lawyer of, uh, at Harvard talking about her meeting with Katanji Jackson-Brown. And um, what it meant to, to hear from someone who also having graduated from college, from Harvard, was able to say, you know, I came into a social field where no one looked at me, looked like me. And the significance now for that woman of having uh, a, a woman of, of color become a Supreme Court justice. And so that was for those who, who paid attention to that, you know, the personal field of that woman was just extraordinary. The poise she held under the pressure of being challenged, let's say, uh, uh, diplomatically challenged, you know, I'm saying. Uh, but the social field is so much larger than that. It's, it's that ability to enter a field that may not look like you, may not want you. Uh, and and uh, how do you interrupt that field? How do you perturbate that field without being drawn into your own rage and anger and the destruction of your own personal field? The, the interaction of uh, activism between the personal field and social field is the activist at some point gets burned out because they keep working against the grain of the dominant social field. And so the work of the social, of the personal field and the social field is to actually bring awareness to this, to that we have to take care of ourselves as we are working to change the larger system. So what I hope for 2000, 2045 is that this premise is built upon, that we can't ever separate the personal field from the social field. And then to add to that, using the language, thank you, Stuart, of the, the idea of the, the boundary that contains information and energy. The noetic field is a field that contains the intelligence, the information of, of uh, the natural world and the cosmos. And the word itself has uh, different histories. William James, the father of American psychology, talked about uh, an experience, a part of a mystic state in which people have the experience of knowing that is uh, not contained per se in language. It's a knowing of some kind of, you know, the, the sort of deep truths of the universe. And he was very close, I think, in his description, because 
the original language of the noetic comes from the Greek word nous, N-O-U-S, it's pronounced nous. And it's contained in, in uh, various of the Socratic dialogues. And Socrates describes it as a knowledge contained that tra that's transhuman, where I would describe it as transrational, meaning it's information that is not dependent on our typical cause and effect relationships. The noetic is associated with significance, with meaning, with understanding that we are part of something so much larger than ourselves. And in his original description of Noose, this is 2,400 years ago, he says it's a product of the star gods, which is striking because we now know that we are made up of about a teaspoon of stardust, you know, of the same components that make up the universe are also in our body. And he was using that as a way of saying, this is an intelligence that the human mind can't fully grasp, but in each of us is a capacity to resonate with that greater intelligence. And from that resonance, develop an orientation to, to life and to others, to the connectedness that we all are part of. Why I think the importance of seeing the dynamic nature of the personal, social, and noetic fields together is I think it has a particular power to support curiosity and detachment. Uh, so curiosity in the sense of back to the inner development goals, openness and a learning mindset. How do you do that under pressure? And you do it not by trying to do it for the first time under immediate threat. You do it by practicing all the time. How do you continue to be curious, to, to recognize discomforting emotions and ask, what is that about? How is it teaching me how to grow as a person? The detachment I'm talking about is when we begin to see ourselves as embedded, the notion of Alan as being a stable, continuing object in the world begins to dissipate. Uh, you know, my values may retain some continuity, but I'm changing all the time. My body, my physical body is changing all the time. My way of understanding the world is changing all the time. For those who have the watching Ken Burns' latest work on, uh, on uh, Benjamin Franklin. It's a striking example of someone who was clearly racially biased, who clearly believed in the inferiority of other races, and then begins to change. He, he remains open as he did in so many ways to what is he now going to see that will change the way he views the world. It also invites a freedom from thoughts and emotions that become identified with self. You know, when I am angry, angry becomes, I, be, I cling to that anger, it's who I am. And, uh, you know, as the Buddhists have, have shown, it's not the having of emotions, it's the nature of being caught by the emotion and being identifying that emotion or thought with oneself. And so part of a field language and field awareness is it's sort of offering liberation from that. It's saying we don't, we don't have to be identified with our thought as if that's ourselves, that this is in constant motion and we can be in constant motion with it. So how does that relate to 2045? If you take me down a little further, Stuart, these are the things that I have seen in groups under pressure. Remember, I started with the Passover story. Well, it always struck me you know, what happened after these plagues, they're released into a desert for 40 years. It doesn't go well. They almost starve to death. They fight with each other. Moses ends up killing a number of people because they worshiped a different God. It doesn't go well. But they somehow retained enough of an identity to be able to move toward a promised land. And I ask myself that as I work with organizations, what is it that allows us to move through these challenging times? What is it that the, the fields, when practiced, you know, provide for groups resilience, not just for individuals, the courage to move forward against the obstacle, the solidarity that's needed, the ability for managing differences. In the Ukrainian story that's unfolding, a woman spoke of being in a basement under fire from the Russians, and they survived by sharing their 
tin, their cans of food, but also in that basement were some neighbors who believed that Russians were the liberators. How do you stay in that basement together without turning on each other? The ability to be with those discomforting emotions. And the last two that I think the noetic is really central for practice is that capacity to be with not knowing. We, we are facing what we really don't know. And the question is not who has the answer. The question is, can we find that answer with each other? And so I wanted to end this part of our time with the idea of silence, that one of the traps of this work, certainly for someone who writes books, is the limitations of language. You know, Rumi says that silence is the language of the divine and the rest is poor translation. It's useful to hold that, you know, to, that we do our best to talk to each other, to try to evoke in each other courage and resilience, but it's limited by our language. And sometimes to just be with each other in silence is the way this can be taken in. I'd love you to share, if you would, a little bit about the the and by the way i, I just want to thank you for your remarks so far in the in the sense that you know when i think about the future personally and my own work it always goes to uh, how human beings might be different in the future how they need to be different and i think you've just done a a beautiful job of of um in an expository way of sharing what is possible out of the field so thank you but if you would share a little bit about some of the current work you're doing with organizations that you're helping steward into the future. Thanks, Stuart. Um, you know, it makes me you know, realize, as you say this, that, that I, I'm not uh, imagining things that don't exist. I'm talking about my immediate experience and trying to translate that for the challenges that lie ahead. Um, and, and I think that's a little different than just trying to uh, imagine things that haven't yet occurred. You know, I have a, 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 a you know, I'm, I'm, I'm greatly appreciative of the fact in that I worked with a half a dozen or more organizations, mostly in healthcare and, and uh, uh, mission driven nonprofits that lasted five, 10, 15, and 25 years. And, and so I got to see the organization as an entity evolve and face different challenges and all along working with the leaders uh, in different roles within the system. And that was just an extraordinary gift for me um, because it, 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 it gave me an overview of a kind uh, that the individuals will come and go, some contributing greatly, but that the system itself is what was the entity to be paying attention to. Uh, I've been working with what you know might be called a startup. It was a group uh, that uh, was co-founded by a woman named Nina Meyerhoff and a man named Domen Kosovar uh, called the One Humanity Institute. And they had this compelling vision that they could create an educational and peace institute different than others on the grounds of Auschwitz and that uh, by creating a campus of buildings that people could go That's where from. they could begin to see a different future that was possible. Along the route, uh, they were stymied by negotiations with Poland around access to this uh, particular area they had identified. And as things would happen, they were gifted a old dilapidated building in the center of Auschwitz, the, the city where Auschwitz, where the German occupied group uh, located Auschwitz. And uh, soon after they purchased a, uh, a building that became open next door, also in need of repair. And so they set their sights on uh, repairing these buildings, one being a bakery and bringing the symbol of baking bread as an organizing symbol of the regeneration of, of what could happen. And uh, then you the and then the invasion of Ukraine happened a month ago. And Nina tells me she just felt this compelling need in the first days even that she should go to Poland and welcome 
the refugees coming from Ukraine. Got uh, 17 teddy bears to to the children as a welcome into this now difficult situation. Over 10 days, maybe two weeks, she ended up giving out a thousand teddy bears. She herself really doesn't know how it all happened. And this led to, you know, there's so much need. What if we took the facility we're rehabilitating and rather it being a co-work space, we make it into a housing space for refugees. And so now that's what they're doing. They're creating uh, seven flats in this building with bunk beds that can house 30 to 40 people in transitional housing. You could probably find it on, a, there's a GoFundMe campaign. Uh, Stuart can ask me for the information I could send it to him. And that's what's calling them now. Thank you for that story, especially the teddy bear piece. I actually am on the advisory board of a nonprofit in San Francisco that, that gives teddy bears to troubled kids. I wanna see if I can't tie this in some um, practical way to, to the fields. You, what have you observed about the field of that particular nonprofit that the individuals um, created? Well, I think that it illuminates some aspects. Um, I was struck by Nina talking about how it wasn't, she didn't sit down and write pros and cons. It was an impulse that she felt needed to be addressed. And uh, it happened just by chance that a few weeks earlier, we talked about the nature of compassion and actually had different views of trying to understand what that might mean. But she said that for her, it meant sometimes putting herself aside and doing what was needed. Over time, I think that has to be joined with self-compassion because there's something again in the personal field that if you give without somehow being aware of how you're receiving, and that could be in many different ways, there's that burnout question. The personal field is animated by paying attention to what is moving through you, one's imagination, one's impulse, uh, one's intuition. And that's part of the transrational aspect of, uh, of the noetic work, but that's part of the personal field, which is that uh, and on the other hand, the logistics behind turning this dilapidated building into a housing is enormous. I mean, and this is where you need the rational. It's like, yeah, we could, even if we find the funds to rebuild it, uh, what are the needs of the people who will be there? How do you, well, what is the cost of heating and repair that would be needed? So you're, you're seeing the bringing together of the rational and the transrational and, the, and again, the challenge of, of doing this, but it was in this example, Nina's attention to an impulse that somehow she was able to act upon. And I guess for all of us here, it's, we all have some measure of this. I'm not saying we all go to Poland, but in our own lives, what is the impulse we have to be kind to someone, to, 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 to address a situation, even if it's minimal? At the social field level, I must say I was struck, and this is my own learning about wanting not just myself, but others to really investigate the field itself. When she first talked about giving teddy bears to the people coming, I imagined the kind of chaos that people would be in. You know, would anyone even be able to give attention to someone, you know, giving out a teddy bear? It, it seemed almost like, you know, outside of that field, and then when Nina described the actual experience of it, seeing the mother, it was like, oh, I get it. You know, as much as I was projecting a kind of uh, survival mentality, which was certainly the case, there was other aspects, the relationship between the mother and her child. The social field is morphic. It's always changing. We have to be conscious of it. Otherwise, we're just naively walking into settings. You know, uh, what was it I grew up in my graduate school is uh, being giggly at a psychoanalytic convention is not going to make you friends. It, yeah. it's, it's, you know, in the law world, it's sort of, you know, this, it's like, what is the emphasis on rationality and reason and evidence and advocacy that creates a field that often becomes fractured and argumentative and, and, and yet good people, good individual people caring people, smart people. Yeah. 
So the social field has that impact. My, my takeaway at, a, at the rational, practical level is that in order to induce change, you've got to stay real conscious of the field that you're creating and the context in which people are doing their best to create something that's different. I think that's beautifully said. I think um, it takes the inner development goals that I mentioned earlier and brings them into an embodied experience. That self-awareness is not just a skill that you check off a list. It's a constant practice that our self-awareness relates to how others will relate to us. That we have blind spots. Oh my God, do we have blind spots. <laughs> Beautiful. You know, there, I'm sure there are a lot of questions, but I'll get to those in a minute. But what I'd love you to do, Alan, is just share a little bit about the project you've been working on in Japan and Hiroshima. Okay, but I want to leave time for, for people to, to make comments. and to. This is an, a phenomenal work. I've been doing it with uh, uh, the Goy Peace Foundation as an organization, and it's related to a spiritual community, Byako Shinko Kai, which has uh, its location at the foot of Mount Fuji. Its inspiration was from a philosopher, a spiritual leader, Masahisa Goy, who almost immediately, from my understanding, after the explosions and in, in, in the, in the war, World War II ending, had an impulse that Japan could be a space to remind the world that peace was possible and needed, and that he would bring around him a cohort of people who would commit to holding out the idea of on a global level that peace was possible. These things can sometimes start so conceptually. I mean, this was such, in some ways, a noetic insight. Uh, but then the practical, along the way, someone came up with the idea of a peace poll in which inscribed in different languages would be the the expression of Masi Sugoi, may peace prevail on earth. There's now 10,000, maybe 100,000 of these around the world. I walk around my neighborhood, I find them. Uh, I mean, I know a little bit about how this happened, but uh, I'm, it, it's sort of like the teddy bear story from 17 to 1,000. It's like these go from 10,000 to 100,000. Uh, they have a ceremony that I've attended uh, on two occasions that is at the foot of Mount Fuji and is a ceremony in which every flag of every nation is presented and prayed over. And it is a mind boggling experience of uh, thousands of people who come together, hundreds of people who participate in the ceremony. More recently, uh, one of the uh, women I work closely with has been developing a um, a home called House of Joy for cancer remission patients. And from that work developed a hospice whose mission is to celebrate the preciousness of each individual's life. And it went from an idea that no one understood, like what are you gonna be your programs? Who are the clinical people who are gonna be there? to, to, to uh, an effort that's being studied now globally about our different ways of living and dying. And she's extending that work more educationally to have everyone think about dying as a aspect of the human cycle that teaches us about how we want to live. So it goes on and on, but you know, I think because of my work, I, I think ideas that could be called lofty, that's not the problem. The problem is joining with a cohort of people to begin saying yes to the vision and finding ways to do that together. Beautiful. Thank you, Alan, for that, uh, those two extraordinary and, and inspirational practical examples of possibility. So I wanna uh, open this up to questions now. Hey, Alan, thanks, thanks a lot. That was, uh, that was touching the whole thing. Um, right at the beginning, you said something about you walk into a room where people are yelling and screaming, and I'm Cuban. To me, that's not an argument. That's, <laughs> that's a celebration. It's like, oh, they're having fun. 
Uh, anyways. Um, yeah, well, I want to, I'm, ad I'm adapting myself to the dominant group because in my Jewish house, five people could have seven arguments going <laughs> at the same time. So I'm but they're familiar all, with but this. They're all, they're all fun. Well, they are until they're not. But yes, I'm in agreement, I'm in agreement with you. I, I, I didn't mean to say that the appearance of argument is necessarily the statement of the social. No, I, I know what you meant. Yeah. I know what no, you meant. but it's good. I'm glad you brought that forward. And the other thing you said was that leadership holds the vision of the future. And I have to ask this question. Do you mean natural leadership, not somebody who was appointed yeah. to yeah. hold the vision of the future, right? Great distinction. The distinction I would make is that everyone's a leader. Parker Palmer's line, you cannot not lead. And when you think in terms of the personal field, we are always in a leadership role. The, 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 the way we presence ourselves is an act of leadership. When I am referencing the servant leadership language, I'm referencing something a bit more within the formal structure of organizations uh, and the positional authority that different people take on and the importance for people in those roles to be able to cultivate themselves and with each other, a vision of a better uh, possibilities for their future. So it is both and that, that leadership is at all levels and that there is a particular role for people in positional roles of authority to hold out in a real way, not some kind of, uh, oh, it's all gonna be fine, um, you know, but in a real way, a better way that we might be together in the future. My own opinion is the people who have given the titles and the power to do that are, are obsolete. So, but the natural leadership, I understand. I have one more question. Just, uh, said, just, just, said, just this, this is we can have an argument here because that's that's what we could we we, we can do that. Um, okay. There, there's a risk to dismissing the positional roles in a system which provide its structure. And that when we dismiss it, we, we don't know how in some ways to be good followers, which is part of leadership, which is to, is to ask and sometimes demand of our leaders that they operate in a way that's, that's considerate of the whole. And it's not either or, but, but I'm, uh, I'm aware of the Teal organizations and the variations over decades now of the leaderless organization. And I think there's a caution there. Yeah, no, no, I, there's no leadership leaderless organizations there's no such thing but uh but having somebody with the the position that's something that we can talk on the side yeah 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 no, good and i have an important question which is you mentioned uh similar organizations to ours and that you know of others that are similar to this 2045 yeah, not not exactly similar because you're unique, and that's what that's what makes you who you are. But there's a group, uh, the thought leader gatherings that I participated in in the Silicon Valley, and now are called Essential Conversations, out of Minneapolis. My colleagues Craig Neal and and Patricia Neal. Um, uh, there is uh, the work done by Service Space. Uh, Nipun Mehta is one of the founders of that, and they have just exploded globally with different ways of convening people for conversations about things that matter in the world. So yes, there, there, are, there are many, and, and that's what I love seeing about 2045. Yeah, because part of what we're trying to do here is, is as somebody, many people have said before, we all think we have the answer and we really have a piece of the answer. And so we're trying to bring the, the puzzle together. Uh, so if you can share that list with us, that'd be great. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, Kelly. Hey, Alan, this is fast. Thank, thank you for coming today. Um, I, something that really struck me that you said was that the entity has kind of a form of its own and people come and go. And I've always thought more, well, it's the people that are the entity. But now when you talk about fields, yeah. that also got me thinking, yeah, my body is changing all the time, but there is a field there. Mm -hmm. And I guess you could, that would be a fractal of this. That's knowledge. right. That's right. Beautiful. Can you expand on that a little more as to how that field stays together or what happens there? Yeah. Wonderful question. Because that, that really is what, what, you know, I became quite interested 
in Sheldrake's work on the morphic field, how we reproduce uh, the forms uh, sometimes outside of time and space. In other words, it's like, well, none of the people here were the people here 20 years ago. How could we be having the same issues? And, and so there is a morph, morphic nature to how form recreates itself. And no one has the exact structural knowledge of how that occurs. There's different theories of how it might occur. Uh, for me, it's the embodied sense. Can we experience ourselves? Just as you said, our bodies are changing. I'm different this morning than I was last night. Um, can we pay attention to fields in that same spirit with knowing that there is a continuity? When, when the Supreme Court Justice talked about going to Harvard and not seeing anyone on the walls of uh, like her, she was experiencing that social field and its messaging and the courage that she demonstrated and the intelligence she demonstrated and the fight she demonstrated to be able to modify that social field, even by just a little. The story of Ruth Bader Ginsburg is the same thing. In the fictional uh, version of that, she's at this big discussion about the Harvard man, and she goes and finds a dress and says to her husband the words, will this make me look like a Harvard man? You know, and he just smiles at her and says, uh, you know, <laughs> I don't think that's what we're trying to do here. Uh, but that's the social field. And it's it, it has a kind of agency of its own that we have to be able to recognize and address. So then one step further on that with Lynn McTaggart's work, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is that one way of addressing it, her way of getting a group together and sending out intentions and things? You know, Lynn was, uh, you know, a, a journalist in many ways, recognizing that there was something operating to create form that was not being addressed in the more traditional scientific areas. And so she went about trying to find language for that, offer examples of people operating. I work with the Institute of Noetic Sciences, and we've been using the language for noetic leadership which comes from the noetic field of um, what it means to integrate the rational and the transrational. The, the uh, Lynn's work is pointing to something and, and I encourage people to look at it, but it's again, there's a difference between the experience and the different interpretations we give it. Uh, so I mentioned Otto Sharma, he has done beautiful work on, on the social field and I highly recommend his, his work, but the language that I'm using is intentionally uh, pointing to it's a, the embedded nature of these things. We're not separating the social field from the personal field, from the noetic field. These are all interacting and part of experience. Wonderful, thank you. Jose. Yeah, Alan, uh, thank you. This is, I love the conversation because it's a different way of viewing a lot of the uh, I've been looking at. Is it fair to say that this social field is an emergent property of, of the personal fields that are interacting? If we include that the social field contains the history of that field beyond the immediate people in the group at the time. In that the, the individuals also have the history, right? The, right. It's, it's, the, it's the personal history that emerges in the collective social field. Is that what you're describing? It's, I, 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 I mean, I'm thinking of the constellation work that grew out of Germany and their ability to bring people together and, and discover historical things that later proved to be true, but they could have had no knowledge of it at the time. So they were actually, the emergent quality here was bringing forward buried contents of their right. individual or collective past. Right. And that would be a wonderful way to hold the emergent quality of groups and social fields, that it right. is always available to further evolution. But it's not simply the people in the room at the moment who determine that. It's, it's not the people in the moment only because they're not only in the moment. They themselves are the field of the past yeah, yes. as well. Right? That's wonderful. Yeah, that's wonderful. But then when you speak of the institution, 
the organization having a field? Is it that the organization, I mean, I'm just, I'm visualizing as you said that, what, what came to mind was here's 50 people that work in, a, in an office and those 50 people cycle through. It's, it's not the same 50 people over you know, a period of time. And yet, you know, 20, 30, 40 years later, some of the same symptoms are happening within the organization. Is it that the organization has a field? Yeah. Or is it that well, the individuals yeah. have passed on through their interaction with each other's fields, this emergent field that now would appear to us as belonging to the organization, but is really the continuation of the field so, of everyone who's interacted. So it's wonderful we have four minutes left to, to you know, tie this all up and, and put a string around it. For my questions, um, we can go um, a little longer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what I love about this is, you know, I'm writing this with my colleague, Mary Jolinas. And from the beginning, I've noticed an evolution from, from people saying, well, what are you talking about? I don't understand that we already have the answers, you know, to the questions you're asking. It's like, how does this all actually emerge in real, in real experience? So this conversation is just, you know, just a lovely early example of trying to put our hands around the meaning, particularly in terms of collaboration and acting for change. My, my short answer as we sort of begin to wind up is this is where the roles of caste systems, patriarchy, influences of capitalism um, begin to reveal themselves because every organization is embedded in something larger. And so to see the toxic masculinity appear again and again in so many and variety of different ways, you know, emanates from, uh, from certain legal, structural, historical past uh, that altered uh, fields at the, at the time and that we're still living under the clouds of. Uh, so I'm not, uh, part of the field awareness is I'm not going to fix something as if it's in the past. I'm going to try to understand its uh, influence and what new behaviors would begin to alter or put pressure on those existing gravitational forces, we could call them. How do we, so, how do we deal with the emergent rather than the, the underlying? So thank you so much. Yeah. So I have a capper question. If you were given your skills, awareness of, of the collective and fields, um, and I forgot to mention, and Alan didn't mention, he also wrote a book called um, Collective Wisdom, which is a, a, a wonderful book. But anyway, if you were given a total clean slate, how would you design learning programs to create a, an organization that not polluted by all of the, the history that we know we don't want? Is there, is there do you have any-, any Yeah, my answer is no. <laughs> no, no, you, you can't do you can't do it, huh? <laughs> well, your whole premise of a clean slate just wipes out the embedded nature of of systems. Uh, okay, so even it's not a clean slate. Oh, okay. It is. It is what it is. And how do we make yeah. it? How okay. do we make it? Yeah. Then the answer is yes. <laughs> That's a longer conversation between the two of us. And that it, I relish. For all of us, I mean, uh, it, you know, my greatest hope is that these kind of conversations stir up new ways of seeing, new ways of, mm. of showing up, new ways of bringing attention to things. That's in relation to the opening comments about the global challenges we face. This is not fixing one thing. Beautiful. I think that's a, a, a wonderful note to, um, to end on. Alan, I want to just thank you from the bottom of my heart for um, what you opened up in this space. And I so appreciate you. So thank you. Together, you know, we created a space together that allowed for this. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you.